Hello. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, water industry technology pitch. Uh, my name's Steve Kay. I'm head of innovation at Anglian Water, and we've got uh, four inspirational speakers uh, to talk to you today, but they have to do it in five minutes. So uh, what we're going to do is take uh, the four presentations um, and uh, back to back, and then we'll take some questions at the end. So we've got um, David Holmes, uh, Raymond Hoon, Kevin Hona, and Nick Mills. Uh, they'll introduce themselves, I'm sure, at the start and say what they do. Um, so if you leave your questions till the end, and uh, you know, um, be, be as challenging as you want to be, and hopefully we'll have a good session. So without further ado, if we start with uh, David Holmes, who's technical director of Fiberlight. Good morning, everybody. Um, eight and one, eight, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, my name's David. I'm the um, technical director of Fiberlight Composites. And my responsibilities are technical innovations and product development. And I'm here to talk about composites, and in particular, um, FRP composites. So, what is a composite? It's just two, it's two dissimilar materials, but we're specifically talking about FRP, which is fiber reinforced plastic. So you have a, um, a resin matrix and within, within inside the internal structure, you have um, long term um, fiberglass. So we've, we term composites as a new innovation. It's not actually, it's been around since the thirties and Fiberlite have been manufacturing FRP manual covers for the past 30 years. So, what are the products we manufacture? We, we manufacture trench covers. These are a, a modular trench covering system the right, that are ideal for trench pits and um, trenches um, that accommodate um, uh, service supplies. And these can be made in bespoke sizes and we can manufacture these products from load ratings from A15, which is 1.5 ton, metric ton, to F900, which is 90 ton. So they're extremely strong, but very, very light. Fiberlight was, was the world's first company to attain kite mark to BS EM124 past 26, which is the European standard for manhole covers. Um, we have a kite mark license to produce C250, which is 25 metric ton load rated covers, and D400, which is 40 ton D400 load rated covers. I mean, we make, um, as you can see, we make quite an extensive and comprehensive range. You can have the covers um, either um, color coded for identification, or you can have bespoke company logos actually molded onto the cover surface itself. We also make electrical draw boxes and junction boxes, um, containment systems to keep um, electrical connections um, dry and um, uh, contamination free. These are manufactured in a closed, both, both products are manufactured in a closed mold environment with steel tools and these, um, these guarantee consistency of wall thickness and performance and quality. One of the major issues with steel, ductile cast iron and concrete infill covers is the weight. And at Fiberlite, we pride ourselves on lightweight but extremely strong covers. I mean, this, this photograph is a typical, sorry. This photograph is a, is a typical, um, cover replacement procedure in the top, top right hand corner with a large cast iron cover, two men with what, what are referred to as picks removing the cover, it's extremely hazardous. If you look at the fiber light cover, which is down at the bottom, it's a single man lift with a specifically designed ergonomically approved lifting handle. So these are the load ratings. 
As you can see, A15 is for pedestrian load ratings, and we go right up to F900, which is for ports and docks, and we manufacture all the load ratings in between. So, to the benefits of the fiber light covers and also GRP covers. Load ratings from A15 to F900. A wide range of colors and shapes. Customized bespoke options are available for retrofit. So this means you could, we could manufacture a cover to be retrofitted into your existing frame. It's a chemically inert product. It's unaffected by underground gases and most chemicals. Completely maintenance free. You fit a fiber light cover and you forget it. There's no repainting, nothing will corrode, and nothing will crack, crumble, or delaminate. They are completely sealed and water and odor tight. They're an excellent insulator, as composite is, against heat. They're very easy to remove and replace. They actually weigh about the third of um, a cast iron um, replica cover. The lifting handle eliminates back injuries. Okay. Um, one to 15 years, incredibly strong monolithic product. There's no bonded joints, excellent skid resistance. And as you can see, the benefits go on and on. So it's out with the old, and it's in with the new. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Out with the old, in with the new. Then uh, we'll move over to uh, Raymond Hoon, um, sales manager at Scott Vickers. Thank you. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Raymond from Scott Vickers. Okay, I actually come from Singapore. Okay, uh, what I'm going to introduce to you is ClearTech system, which my company actually manufacture it. Okay, what the topic is today is treating construction site silty water runoff in Singapore. Could it work in UK? Give me a moment. Sorry. Okay, can we go back to the slide? The, the first slide. Let's give it a Thank you. Okay, so sorry for the delay. Okay, water treatment in Singapore. We have about over 90 inches of rainfall in Singapore per annum, where in UK, okay, we, did a, we did a search, okay, UK has about approximately about 45 inches per year. Okay. In fact, Singapore is a very small area, okay, we have, it's only about 710 kilometers square, okay, and we have very heavy water demand because of the population there. Okay. Two-thirds of the total land area are used as catchment for water supply. In fact, we also have to buy water from our neighbours. And over 90% of all silty water discharge actually comes from construction sites. Okay, so the government actually gave us a regulation of we are not allowed 
to discharge more than 50 ppm of water out of the construction area. Okay, generally what you see is before treatment, okay, you will see it's very muddy. It's like a tea with milk. But after treatment, okay, what we will see is a water that is literally very, very clean, but it's still not drinkable. Okay, this is a typical layout of a construction site, okay, where this is the whole site. Okay, you will have your hoardings around, sorry. Okay, you have your hoardings around the whole site where we will build parameter drain. Okay, whenever there's a rain, waters that actually comes into your site will fall into the drain and be diverted to a sedimentation tank here. Okay, after the sedimentation tank, we will have a treatment system where you'll be connected to treat the dirty water and it can be discharged out of the site here. Okay. So in your parameter drain, we actually encourage you to have silk fence so that you can actually corner off all the big items. Oh. This is a typical picture of a sedimentation okay, tank in a site. 10 seconds. Yeah. Okay, and this is the silk fence cut off drain okay, where you have the silk fence. These are just some of the examples of the equipment. We have a 20, 60, 40, and 80. Okay, this is a typical water system, treatment system. Okay, where the water will actually come in from here, goes into your primary chamber, go into a secondary chamber, and the water will actually go out as a discharge. Okay, great. We're going to have to finish there, I'm afraid. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Did you give him some injury time there, some extra time? Because he's had a delay at the start. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, okay, Kevin Huna um, is next. Uh, how do I close it? Kevin is marketing manager at Drago. How do I close this one and get the other one open? I'm just thinking. It's probably escaping. Yeah. I think the other one's a bit right. right. That's it. That's mine, isn't it? Yeah. I let it run a little bit long, but I assumed it added to me to say. Extra time. That's why I said it injury time. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. See if I can get this microphone in a suitable position. Um, I'm going to say a few words about things that have changed in portable gas detection over the last few years. Um, I, could, I could take a lot longer than five minutes over this, so I've picked a focus on one thing which I can present in about five minutes. But first of all, what has changed? Um, If you look at instruments now and compare to what was on the market 10 years ago, they're a hell of a lot smaller and a hell of a lot lighter. They're not much bigger than mobile phones. That means it's practical for people to wear these on a daily basis as part of their protective equipment. Um, that's, that's been a major change in, in what's going on in the gas detection world. The second thing is the move towards daily function testing of instruments before use. Um, this is because sensors in instruments can fail in a manner which cannot be disclosed and we need to be certain these instruments are working so increasingly people gas test these instruments on a daily basis. Thirdly, so-called docking stations, automated calibration stations have become increasingly commonly used and these not only provide for the calibration of the gas detectors or the function testing of the gas detectors, they provide a lot of backup facility in terms of managing issue and receipt of instruments and therefore providing asset management tracking of where products are. And fourthly, what I'm going to focus a couple of minutes on, um, the use of infrared as a gas detection method for flammable gas rather than the conventional catalytic sensor. Conventionally, for flammable gases, and we're talking here about gases like methane or other hydrocarbons, uh, we've used a catalytic sensor. This is a device where the gases 
uh, literally burnt at low temperature, generating some heat, and that heat is used to measure the degree, the amount of flammable gas that's present. This type of technology is very well established. It's been around for a very long time, and um, the, the sensors are simple and relatively inexpensive. Typical lifetime of these sensors is about two to three years, but they can be damaged by the presence of other materials in the atmosphere. So typically, some organic materials, when burning on these sensors, they cause loss of sensitivity. Presence of H2S, hydrogen sulfide, which is commonly present, of course, in, in wastewater systems, causes loss of sensitivity of these gases. So an alternative is to use a purely physical principle. Rather than using a catalytic reaction, which is a chemical principle, there is a physical principle which is capable of monitoring flammable gases, and that's the absorption of infrared radiation. So hydrocarbons, which most flammable gases are, absorb at a specific wavelength in the infrared, and this wavelength allows, this absorption allows you to relate the concentration of flammable gas in the atmosphere to the signal you get out of the infrared detec detection system. What are the benefits of this? There's no way, unlike catalytic sensors which can be damaged or poisoned by the presence of materials, there's nothing to poison. It's a purely physical process. Secondly, um, there's no routine degradation of the sensor. So you get a long lifetime. You can actually have sensors last at least five, maybe even eight or ten years, um, which is a reduction in maintenance costs. There's no way it's going to fail and not tell you it's failed. It's got about 30 seconds. Okay. Okay, with that. Uh, and it's reduced calibration because you only have to calibrate annually instead of every six months. Disadvantage is the higher initial cost of purchase. Now, as the price of infrared has come down, so the gap between the cost of using an infrared sensor versus cost of using a catalytic sensor has closed. And on a current, cat on a current calculation, it's possible to argue that it isn't, the reduced calibration completely offsets the increased purchase cost of the infrared sensor. Um, so over a five year period, this should be just about cost neutral. I see that as getting actually more favorable towards infrared sensing technology as prices continue to come down for the more complex components involved in that. Okay, so, um, thank that's, you. that's it. Well done, Kevin, thank you. I keep roughly to my... Uh, Okay, and um, last but not least is Nick Mills, who's a project manager at Thames Water, uh, working in the area of sludge and energy innovation. Nick. Thank you. Great, so yes, I'm Nick Mills. Uh, I'm going to talk about a concept which we've uh, been developing called Advanced Energy Recovery. And yes, we're going to talk about sludge just before lunch. Um, so why, why have I got a job, really, is this question. Um, why, why is sludge need innovating? And there's a huge pressure on our land bank, more commercial anaerobic digestion is competing with our land bank, so we need to find options that aren't recycling to land. Renewable energy is a big driver, there's economic drivers, there's regulatory, there's carbon saving, which means that we're encouraged to do more renewable energy generation. And, and the sheer cost of energy is getting uh, astronomical. Um, our energy bill, electricity alone was 100 million pounds last year, and that's due to right due to rise significantly. So, we luckily have a resource in our hands. Uh, sludge has the same calorific value as wood chip and some types of coal. And for anyone that's shaken my hand during this event, they are, that's not my picture. They are not my hands at the top of that. So what do we do at the moment in terms of recovery from sludge? Uh, this is using anaerobic digestion and we take about a third of the energy out, the potential energy in sludge, and convert it into a biogas. Uh, there's a technology that the industry, including Thames in a big way, are now uh, delivering, which is THP, thermal hydrolysis, is an advanced digestion pretreatment. It improves and has other advantages, um, but it doesn't get us up there. And this is where advanced energy recovery comes in. Um, it, it allows us to convert all of that energy pretty much um, post-digestion. So how do we do that? And this application works best on a THP site with digestion, where we've got a, a gas engine. Um, and dewatering technology is very key, and we've identified high dry solids dewatering as the key step post-digestion. Uh, Gives us 
uh, a smallest amount of water to remove with drying. And the drying has to be sustainable. And I'll come on to how, the, how we achieve that in a minute. But uh, it's low temperature drying to produce a product that's at about 90% dry solids so or 10% moisture content. And at that point, advanced energy recovery processes, we're talking gasification and pyrolysis, become feasible. So you end up with a fuel gas or a syn gas coming out of that process, or a char and an ash, which you can then put into a second CHP unit, and you've pretty much doubled your renewable energy output from a site uh, like this. And you've obviously got heat that goes back into the drying step, hence sustainable. No fossil fuel required, very efficient, safe dryers, and even the, the low temperature ones aren't even ATEX rated. So it's a very safe technology, as it's not uh, dr drum dryers with all the accidents that we've had in the past in industry, which, which has put us off. So there's, there's the concept very quickly. What next is a full-scale demonstration plant. We're, we're currently investigating a number of technologies for the, the advanced energy, energy recovery box. So there's a competitive tender happening at the moment. Uh, and I want uh, to find an investor, spend something like 14 million pounds to build uh, exactly what I've just shown you. And the paybacks are looking very, very good. We're looking four to six years, and the application in the UK is quite enormous. So that's, that's my pitch. I've got a four minute, one minute left. That's brilliant. Okay. Well done, <laughs> Nick. Time to spare. Thank you. Okay, well, you've given us an extra minute for questions there, so... Oh, that's, 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 that's back five. So well done to all our speakers for getting their messages across. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions? We've got about 18 minutes, um, and then the next session will start. So any questions from the floor for our speakers? One down here, front. I think we've got a microphone coming around. OK. Uh, it's, uh, my name's Mark Booth, I work for United Utilities. And it's a question for Nick, really, because um, the whole area of digestion and CHP is a big area for all water companies. Um, so in essence, can I just ask a bit more explanation of this? So we're almost doing the digestion process as we're used to. And then you're taking almost the cake out the back end of the digester process and reworking the cake. Exactly. Is this on? That's exactly what we're doing. Um, and what we have identified is these advanced processes are very good. They've moved on. Other industries are, are, are delivering these things at full scale. So really, we're, just, we're stealing ideas from other people here. But the concept is digestion first. Digestion is the, one of the most efficient energy recovery methods. Um, when you compare it to these, these post-digestion methods, they, it, you want to do digestion first. Reduce the volume that you've got to treat. Um, but yes, exactly, we, we are recovering post-digestion. Okay, and I, don't, I don't know whether the graph was to scale, but it was almost suggesting that you were, going, you were getting double the benefits. Yes, Wow. that's what we're saying. And also, these technologies sit in a different category for the rocks, so you, the incentives drive, drive you to do this. Yeah. But we wouldn't envisage not doing the digestion first. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, and just to build on that, uh, Nick, one from me. Have you looked at putting um, gas back into the grid uh, rather than converting it into electricity? Yes. Yeah, we've got a plant at Digcot, um, which is a biomethane injection plant. So we, 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 have looked, we have looked at it. Um, the economics with the RHI make it very attractive. But when you've got processes requiring heat on site, um, so for the advanced digestion sites, we didn't, we didn't go forward on the sites that we're building now with biomethane. And personally, I've done a bit of work on the uh, environmental and the sustainability of biomethane injection. And uh, the, the incentives are very well placed. OK, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Question. Um, well, one from me, David, uh, about your covers. Um, I'd just like to ask you, have you looked at the embodied carbon of GRP covers compared to other conventional materials? Um, is that on? Oh, on that again. Okay. Um, yes, we have. And um, the, the, the manufacturing process makes the um, uh, GRP access cover almost um, carbon neutral. Um, there are... One of the biggest advantages is that we are using recyclable um, reinforcement within the internal structure. 
and also there's no onward um, carbon footprint as far as maintenance costs are concerned because it's a completely maintenance free product. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Can, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question about okay. that? How many have you got in the road being driven over by lorries <laughs> 10 times a day? Yeah. We don't. So, oh, there we go. Um, we don't actually have a highway offering for the okay. access cover. Um, we currently believe that the, the most appropriate product for the highways is a ductile manual cover. Okay. And um, we are somewhat cost prohibitive. Um, so when you do look at the cost of a, a, a GRP access cover, you've really got to look at TCO. You've got to look at total cost ownership to um, you know, really identify the benefits. Okay. Okay, question at the back. Yeah, I was very interested in terms of RHI claims uh, about your sustainable thermal drying. Could you just give me a brief outline of, of how that works? Yeah, it's fine. I, I, <laughs> we're struggling here, aren't we? Um, it's, it's about it, the biomethane plant we've got at Didcot consumes an awful lot of propane, and it's, and it's regarding the displacement of carbon intensive electricity with the supply chain for the natural gas so there's a bit of work which we could probably follow up and talk about afterwards uh, but the but the RHI so I meant the actual technology because if, if uh, oh, I, see, think, sorry. I, think, I think drying digested is an eligible use of for a RHI of heat so, so if, it, if it's a sustainable one obviously this is, has quite an effect I mean you could have a, an unsustainable version of drying digested which boils off the water, but this, this sounds like a different thing. The, if I understand correctly, the, 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 the numbers I showed you there, we have to assume no benefit from RHI for the drying. It's literally to get the job done with the heat that we have on site. So you're not looking, this is not a new piece of technology, this is just the word it's sustainable in, in that you're using the heat for drying? Yes. That's <laughs> all it is, just words. Okay, anyone else? Got Raymond and Kevin uh, getting off lightly at the moment. So, uh, okay, well, I'll ask uh, a question. Right, um, Kevin, sorry, your gas detector. Um, it, it looks a sort of safer option, but how does it compare on cost to conventional detectors? The if you, if you look at the actual sensors involved, the infrared sensor is probably three times the cost of a standard catalytic sensor. But when you take account of the reduced maintenance frequency and the reduced calibration frequency and the cost of that, it just about balances out. Um, and it's getting closer all the time. And if you can sell them in high numbers, will the cost drop even more? Um, Yes, any, anything that you manufacture, the larger the volume you manufacture, the lower the manufacturing cost. Um, we have seen a step change downwards in the cost of manufacturing infrared sensors, as not just for portable instruments, also fixed gas detectors on sites. The infrared sensors for those are much less expensive now than they were relatively, say, 10 years ago. Okay, thank you. Can I have a question at the back? Uh, question for Raymond. Uh, what's the uh, largest site you've installed this uh, technology on? Okay, in fact, in Singapore, we are talking about, um, in general, the largest site will be somewhere about um, 30,000 meters square. Okay, where we can, you, you, you can have actually a, a few equipments uh, put at site. It doesn't need to be just one. You can actually have multiple equipments aside. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for you, Raymond, actually. Um, it, you talked about a process that looks quite impressive in terms of dirty water becoming clean. Uh, but what, what, what are the advantages? You know, what, overall, what are the advantages of, of doing what you're doing? Um, okay, the advantages of actually having this uh, filtration system is you can actually recycle the water. Okay, you can actually use it into other usage, such as um, cleaning of the site, uh, refilling your this uh, washing bay, 
okay, even dust suppression, you can actually wet the site so that you don't have so much dust at site. Okay, thanks. Any more? Okay, well, if you've got no more questions, uh, we'll close it there. And if you'd like to give a big hand to all our speakers for doing an excellent job.